It is really an honor to be here, and I thank Michael and Diane and the rest of the conference organizers for inviting me here to spend a few minutes with you talking about powerful, impactful, influential leadership. And they are a part of what I like to call Carla's pearls, my mm -mm, hard earned and hard learned pearls after being a woman on Wall Street as of last summer for 30 years. I dare say, ladies and gentlemen, that I have learned a few things about not only surviving, but more importantly, thriving in the seat that you sit in or the seat that you aspire to sit in. And that's really what the pearls are all about. But as I am in a room full of leaders, I'd like to give you my perspective on what powerful, impactful, influential leadership looks like. Because you see, after 30 years, I've had the honor and privilege of taking lots of companies public, doing lots of large common stock transactions, convertible transactions, and I've had a bird's eye view of what I think powerful leadership looks like, and not so much. And obviously, we are in an environment that is very dynamic. It is very innovative. It is changing faster than we have seen change in any of our lifetimes. And it demands a different type of leadership, especially for those of you who are like me, who are boomers in the room. We cannot be powerful leaders if we choose to manage the way that we were managed. So I would like to give you my views around that. But before I do, I'd like to give you two pearls that I hope will help you to maximize your success in the seats that you are sitting in or the seats that you aspire to sit in. Now, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I've been on the street for three decades. I am a seasoned, not old, seasoned deal-making gal. So I'd like to make a deal with you this afternoon. I will agree to tell you exactly how it is if you will agree to ask me anything that's on your mind when we get to Q&A. Do we have a deal? And if your boss happens to be in the room and you have a question pertaining to you, just say, oh, I had a friend that had this particular issue, and, uh, and we can take care of that question. So the first two pearls that I'd like to leave you with that I hope will be personally useful to you are around this concept of currency. There are two types of currency in any environment, performance currency and relationship currency. But I want you to think to yourself that a dollar is not a dollar is not a dollar. Performance currency is the currency that is generated by your delivering that which was asked of you and a little bit extra. Every time that you deliver on an assignment above people's expectations, you generate performance currency. It works exactly like the stock market. Any time a company says to the street that they will deliver 25 cents a share, and that company delivers 40 cents a share, that stock goes up every single time, and so will yours. Performance currency is valuable for three reasons. Number one, early on in any environment and early on in your career, it will get you noticed. It will create a reputation for you. Number two, early on in your career, Early on in any new environment, it will get you paid and promoted. And number three, it may even attract the sponsor for you. And let me pause there, because I'm sure many of you know that the most important relationship in your career will be a sponsor relationship. And because many of you are DNI professionals, you are uniquely in a seat where you can influence the sponsorship of many of the people that are in your organization. But let me just delineate for those of you who may still not know the difference between the mentor and the sponsor. The mentor, in my parlance, as I write about in my first book, Expect to Win, the mentor is the person that you can tell the good, the bad, and the ugly to. So by definition, it needs to be somebody that you trust, and it needs to be somebody that knows you very well. You can't just say, oh, Mary's been doing this for 30 years, she's successful, she's gonna be my mentor. Because if she doesn't know you very well, she cannot be a great mentor to you. Because a mentor's job is to give you tailored advice. Tailored specifically to you and to your career aspirations. 
So by definition, she must know you very well. Your mentor does not need to be within your organization, nor do they need to look like you, but they must understand your context. They must understand the context that you are working in in order to give you tailored advice that you can successfully execute. Now here's the secret. You can survive a very long time in your career without a mentor, but you will not ascend in any organization without a sponsor. The sponsor is the most important of the three relationships, the advisor, the mentor, and the sponsor. And as I said earlier, the mentor is the person you tell the good, the bad, and the ugly to. The sponsor is not the person you tell the good, the bad, and the ugly to. The sponsor is the person you tell the good, the good, and the good. Because this is the person that is carrying your paper into the room. This is the person that behind closed doors will argue passionately on your behalf as to why you should get the promotion, why you should get the great bonus, why you should get the next great opportunity. Make no mistake, this is the person that is spending their valuable political and social capital on you. So if you have good performance currency in an environment, it raises your level of visibility in that environment such that a sponsor may be attracted to you. Now, frankly, that is nirvana. When someone looks at you and takes you under their wing and said, I'm going to make it happen for you. I'm going to make sure you are successful in this environment. But for many of us in this room, that will never happen. So if you have good performance currency, it raises your level of visibility such that when you exercise your power to ask for a sponsor, it heightens the probability that that person will answer in the affirmative. Or it at least heightens the probability that they will seriously consider it. And so often, I've spoken in a number of companies, and they've said, you know, we don't really understand why our mentoring program is not working. And let me give you a little bit of a perspective. The word mentor is loaded because people have different definitions of what mentor means. And in many cases, when you assign me to Emily as my mentor and I don't know her, I have expectations as the mentee that Emily's going to give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. She's going to give me the king, the keys to the kingdom. She's going to give me everything that I need to know in order to be successful in this environment. Emily, on the other hand, does not know me. And so she's never going to give me the good, the bad, and the ugly. She'll give me basic advice. But if I'm going to be working with Tom, and Tom is not a cool dude, she's never going to say, watch out for Tom. He's not a cool dude. <laughs> because she doesn't know me. So she's not going to give me that level of counsel. So there is an implicit trust within the mentor-mentee relationship. So what I have advised companies who've asked me about this, I say, change the name. Call it an advisor program. Now, I happen to be in financial services and wealth management, so advisor has a different definition as well. But call it an advisor program. Call it a coaching program. Call it something else, unless you clearly define the expectations of a mentor-mentee program so that it is clear what I should expect. But so often, the mentor knows that the mentee is not happy. They quickly become disillusioned, and they start missing meetings. The mentee is not happy because they're not getting what they thought they were going to get, and thus the program doesn't work. So you have to be very clear and discreet about the expectations when you are assigning such relationships. Now, the performance currency, as I said, helps you if you have to exercise your power. Because sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's not going to happen where someone chooses you and said, I'm going to make it happen. And that's how it worked for me. I went to someone where I had to exercise my power and ask for a sponsor. It was the year that I was up for the big promotion, the managing director. I knew exactly what I was playing for. I knew how the process worked, and I knew who had seats around the decision-making table. And when you're thinking about a sponsor, or even if you are assigning sponsors, here's the profile of a good sponsor. Somebody who has exposure to that person's work, somebody who has a seat at the decision-making table, and somebody who has some juice. 
i.e. a respected voice at that table. They have the ability to get it done. So I went to someone with that profile and I said, it's really important for me to get promoted this year. There's nothing else that I can show this organization about my readiness or my worthiness. But you and I both know that somebody has to be behind closed doors pounding the table on my behalf. You know me, you know my work, you know the client feedback, and I think you would do a terrific job on my behalf. <laughs> and the guy sort of humming, 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 humming. But then he said, yes. Why was that an important conversation for me to have? If he had told me no, he was going to have to tell me why. And that would have been important data for me from which to make a decision. Data is your friend. Data is your friend. You cannot fix it if you don't know that it's broken. So you should always create a safe place where somebody's willing to give you the real deal data. But if he said yes, I trusted that he'd be able to get it done. Now, it was my performance currency that enabled me to have that conversation. But here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the problem with performance currency. Over time, performance currency starts to experience diminishing marginal returns. That buck 50 works its way right back down to a dollar. Why? Because now you have created a new standard of excellence. Everybody knows that you will do a great job. Everybody expects that you will always deliver. So there's no longer any premium associated with your deliverable. The currency that now becomes most important is the relationship currency. And relationship currency is worth about 225. And it never <laughs> experiences any diminishing marginal returns. Relationship currency is the currency that is generated by the investments that you make in the people in your environment. The investments that you make in the people in your environment. None of us work in a silo anymore. We are all working in highly interdependent environments. So at a minimum, you must have a relationship with every seat that touches your seat. If the only person that knows that you're doing a great job is your boss, then your ability to ascend in any environment is going to be vulnerable. Why? That person may leave the organization. They may lose their seat at the decision-making table, or they may lose their juice. So it's your job to make sure as many people as possible in that organization is aware of your outsized contribution. So often, I hear people say to me, well, you know what? I'm not going to engage in all that relationship building. I'm not going to engage in all those politics. I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to let my work speak for me. But guess what? The work does not speak. <laughs> you must put your work in context. And the only way that you can put your work in context is through the relationships that you have in your environment. And I will tell you another thing that I hear all the time. Oh, Carla, it's so difficult to form these relationships in my professional environment. I will humbly submit to you that it is no more difficult to build relationships in your professional environment than it is in your personal life. It is simply frequency of touch. Frequency of touch. If you think about the person right now that comes to mind that you're close to in your personal life, how did you get close to that person? Perhaps you're thinking about somebody from college. Maybe you stood in the registration line together, and then you figured out that you were both econ majors, and you said, I'm going to be late. Save me a seat. Oh, let's walk over to the keg party together. Let's get a group and go to the football game. <laughs> Frequency of touch. So when you are in your professional environment, create opportunities to touch. And here's the secret. In a professional environment, it's much easier. Because with very light touches, people think they know you. <laughs> you can see people over and over and over in the elevator. You'd be surprised. Someone will say your name. Oh, yeah, yeah, good gal, good gal. You've only seen them four times in the elevator this week. <laughs> or you sit next to them at a town hall and you say, should I ask this question? What do you think about this question? Should I ask this question? And the easiest way to build a relationship with someone, easiest way is to demonstrate that you are listening to them. Why? Everybody values being heard. Everybody values being heard. So when you say something as simple as, did I understand you to say? Or let me repeat what I think I heard you say. The person on the other side of that conversation is thinking to themselves, wow, she was listening. 
wow, he heard me. And you have just created immediate currency that you can trade on to build that relationship. And I will tell you, here is why I feel that relationship currency is so very, very important. Your ability to ascend in any organization will be a function of somebody's judgment. Judgment about whether or not you're ready. Judgment about whether or not the team will follow you. And judgment about whether or not you will ultimately be successful. And ladies and gentlemen, judgments are directly influenced by relationships. And if you're not convinced yet, let me give you my last piece of evidence. Everybody in this room has power. Hard-earned personal currency. But I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how many people in this room will use their hard-earned personal currency on somebody that they do not know? Mm-hmm, exactly. So the next time that you are shying away from investing in relationships, remind yourself that it will rarely, if ever, be the case that you won't get elevated because somebody doesn't like you, but it will absolutely be because somebody doesn't know you. Your performance currency may get your name on the short list that is being discussed behind closed doors, but when your name is called, if there isn't anybody in that room that can speak up on your behalf, they simply go to the next name. And it has nothing to do with your ability to do the job, but everything to do with whether or not somebody in that room knows you well enough to make a comment when your name is called. And oh, by the way, the comment can be as simple as, oh, yeah, 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 good gal, good gal. Oh, yeah, 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 he's a safe pair of hands. That's all that said, check, move on, <laughs> right? But if they don't know you, they say nothing, and no one says anything, and they go, okay, mm -hmm. next name. So it is imperative that you invest in the relationships. In my view, it's the only thing that really holds us back from getting to the C-suite and to more senior positions. It's not whether or not you can do the work. You've been in an organization for 10 years, your ability to do the work, there's no debate. People know you can do it with your eyes closed, but the question is, do you know, do they know you well enough? to speak on your behalf and spend their valuable currency on you. Now, as I turn my attention to powerful, impactful, influential leadership, it's all around the letters in the word leader. The L stands for leverage. Powerful, impactful, influential leaders understand that there is no monopoly on intelligence. You won't always have the best idea, you won't always have the right idea, but somebody in your environment has the intellect, the experience, and or the relationships to help the team successfully prosecute any endeavor. And if you are a powerful, impactful, influential leader, your job is to create an environment where those who are working with you, notice I said with you and not for you, those who are working with you want to contribute their out-of-the-box ideas. Without those ideas, you cannot innovate. Without being able to innovate, you will not compete in this market. It is all around innovation. So it is your job to create an environment where people are clear that there is no retribution for making a mistake, because if there is a big retribution for making a mistake, they will not take that risk. And you need people with a mindset of being comfortable taking risks. That's the only way you're going to be able to innovate. In fact, they must be comfortable failing. You need to create an environment as a leader that it's okay to fail. Take a page out of the technology industry's book and just fail fast. And oh, by the way, when you fail, celebrate. Say, you know what? Nice job, Roger. Way to go, Renee. If we had not taken that risk, we would not have the following information. So it didn't work, but here's what we learned. Let's leverage that, leverage that into the next opportunity. Let's leverage that into the next try. So it's all about creating leverage in your team. If all roads lead back to you, then by definition, your success as a leader is going to be capped. Why? Because you're one man. You're one woman. So the trick is to leverage other people's intellect, leverage other people's experience, and leverage other people's relationships in order to have the team successfully prosecute and compete internally and externally. 
The first E stands for efficiency. I've noticed that powerful, impactful, influential leaders are very clear about what success looks like. Even in the face of obscurity, even when you are doing something that you have never done before, and you really don't know where this is going to end up, and perhaps you cannot call success for the year, you can't even call success for the quarter, but you may be able to call success for the week. You can call success for the day, and maybe you just define success for the half day that you are out on retreat. But once you define success, now you have motivated and inspired your team to outperform. Because I happen to believe as humans, we'll all program where we want to do well. And when you make it real clear around what success looks like, now you give people the opportunity to outperform. And that will disproportionately accrue to your status in the leadership seat. The A, and many of you have heard me talk about this before, my good friend Sid and Emily and others in the room, you know how I feel about authenticity. It is your distinct competitive advantage because nobody can be you the way that you can be you. And the day that you received your opportunity at your respective companies, somebody else didn't get the job because you were the best person for the job. So the last thing that you should ever do is to submerge that which is uniquely you. Anytime that you are trying to speak or behave in a way that is inauthentic to who you really are, you will create a competitive disadvantage. You're using valuable intellectual capacity that you could use to really hear what your client is saying, yet is not articulating. Valuable intellectual capacity that you could use to demonstrate that quick twitch response valuable intellectual capacity that you could use to co-create with that person on the other side of that conversation, which is what this environment demands, on-the-spot creation. As quiet as it's kept, ladies and gentlemen, most people are not comfortable in their own skin. So when they see someone who is comfortable and confident in their skin, they will gravitate towards you. They absolutely want some of that. I will tell you that if your success like mine depends upon your ability to successfully penetrate relationships, the easiest way to penetrate a relationship is to bring your authentic self to the table. When you bring your authentic self to the table, people will trust you. And trust is at the heart of any successful relationship. This was a very interesting lesson for me to learn. As many of you know, I am a singer. I've done three CDs and five sold out con concerts at Carnegie Hall. But when I first started in this business, I didn't want anybody to talk about the fact that I was a singer. I wanted to be known as a no nonsense, hard driving, analytical, quantitative investment banker. I'm not here to sing and dance, boys. Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> didn't want anybody to talk about it until I saw the client reaction. My colleagues would often take me into a pitch and say, oh, this is Carla Harris, our capital markets banker. But what you really ought to know about Carla, she's an amazing gospel singer. She sung at Carnegie Hall, Radio City, the Apollo. And I'm there rolling my eyes until I saw the reaction. Oh, you're a singer. Oh, I so admire people who can sing. And I personally love to sing, but my family will only let me sing in the shower. <laughs> and maybe you can talk to my daughter about how she integrates her love of the arts and her academics. And there we were having a 15-minute meeting before the meeting. Are you with me, Catalyst? <laughs> the meeting before the meeting. So when I sat down to pitch, they heard me with a different ear. They saw me through a different lens because Carla Harris, the singer, was allowed to be in the room with Carla Harris, the banker. I naturally differentiated myself from the other five bankers that would come in there and pitch that same IPO that afternoon. So now, Whenever I go into a new situation, oh, I bring Carla Harris, investment banker. I bring Carla Harris, the prayer warrior. Carla Harris, investment manager. Carla Harris, the singer. Carla Harris, the writer. Carla Harris, the speaker. Carla Harris, the mother. Carla Harris, the golfer. Carla Harris, the football fan. I bring all those Carlas to the table. <laughs> because I don't know which Carla will be the one that will connect and allow me to own that relationship in a proprietary way. Your authenticity is at the heart of your power, and it is at the heart of powerful, 
impactful, influential leadership. And it is imperative that if you are sitting in the leadership seat, that you bring your authentic self to the table. Because when you bring your authentic self to the table, you will motivate others to bring their authentic selves to the table. And any time any of us is in an environment where we can be who we really are, we will always outperform. And once again, that will accrue to your status in the leadership seat. Now the D, the D stands for decisiveness and it stands for diversity. I had the privilege of hearing Meg Whitman speak when she was CEO of eBay. And she said something that I will never forget. And that is the price of inaction is greater than the cost of making a mistake. If you are a powerful, impactful, influential leader, you must be decisive. Yes, it is important to gather data. Yes, it is important to solicit opinions. But at the end of the day, the team is depending upon you to make a decision. If they think you will not make a decision, it certainly will detract from your power and it will contribute to a lack of productivity on your team. Because then the commentary is, oh, no, 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 don't bother executing that assignment. She's got to talk to 20 more people. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. He's got to, you know, he's got to get this amount of data. So just wait. Lack of productivity. That will cause you to be uncompetitive as a leader internally and it will certainly impair your ability to compete externally. So it's important that even in the face of obscurity, as I said earlier, you must make a decision. And do not be so afraid of making a mistake that you get analysis paralysis. If you make a mistake, take the blessing of the lesson and move on. Because every experience brings you one or two things, a blessing or a lesson. Either you get that thing you were going for, and now you know how to do it differently. But at the end of the day, you must make a decision. And in this environment, you must make a decision quickly. Because things are moving, as I said, at a rate that we have never seen before. Now, let's talk about diversity and why it is so very important for innovation. It's interesting to me that almost 30 years into this conversation around diversity and now diversity and inclusion, I still hear people talking about, quote, what is the business case around diversity? Really interesting, almost three decades into it. Well, if you're still struggling with what the business case for diversity is, I'm going to give it to you this afternoon. And it goes like this. If you will agree with me that we all are in some way competing around innovation, and innovation is the dominant competitive parameter in every industry, then you must agree that you need a lot of different ideas in the room to obtain and retain a leadership position with that one innovative idea. And if you need a lot of ideas in the room, because innovation is born from ideas, you better have a lot of different perspectives in the room because ideas are born from perspectives. And if you need a lot of perspectives in the room, you're going to need a lot of experiences in the room because perspectives are born from experiences. And if you need a lot of experiences in the room, you better start with a lot of different people in the room because experiences are born from people. So to get to that one innovative idea that would allow you to obtain and retain a leadership position, you must start with a lot of different people in the room. There's your business case for diversity. <laughs> and it's important if you are in the leadership seat today, you must have a mindset of an inclusive leader. And I get asked the question all the time, what does inclusive leadership look like? And it begins with someone who has the power and the courage to solicit other people's voices. You must be intentional about soliciting other people's voices on your team. You cannot just assume that people know that they should speak up, that they know that they should contribute. Because if they have been in that environment for a long time, and the environment and culture has been one way, they are not going to trust that change in the short run. So if you really want to underscore that it's a new day, a new culture, and you really are putting forth a new dimension, then you must solicit people's voices. And I'm a big fan of repetition. So as the leader, at least four times when you are having a team meeting, hey, Sandra, what are you thinking about that? Okay, 
That's an interesting idea. But Tom, how would you push back on Sandra's idea? We got to have some kind of resistance here so we can figure out where our gaps are. If we're going to go to market, let's figure out where all the gaps are. I want you to challenge that position. Get your team used to challenging each other's position in a way that is constructive so that you can, in fact, create. But solicit Sandra's voice. Solicit Randy's voice. After around four times as a leader doing that, they will come prepared to contribute. You will no longer need to do that. But you have to be intentional about soliciting their voices. And I use the word courage. And so often, people forget this word. Because whenever you are trying to transform an environment, somebody has to be courageous. Because there's so much resistance to change, because that's who we are as humans. So someone has to have the courage to, comp to repeatedly push the point, push the point, push the point, ask the questions, challenge, solicit. Courage is a big deal when you're trying to transform an environment. It will not just happen without the intentionality. And the intentionality takes some courage. You also must be accountable. You must be accountable. If it is a goal, then it needs to be something that you talk about from a strategic standpoint. It can't be the extra. If you're going to talk about the sales goals, you're going to talk about the profitability goals, you're going to talk about cost containment, you have to also put this as part of the overall strategy. Without this being successful, you cannot accomplish the rest. And again, with the leadership continuing to say it and putting some teeth behind it, it will make all the difference. And lastly, you must be consistent. If you're going to be an inclusive leader, you must be consistent. It cannot be a bull market phenomenon. I get asked the question all the time why we aren't father in financial services. And while we are in a markedly different place than we were when I started in 1987, still a lot of work to do. But it has largely been a bull market phenomenon. When things are going well, lots of resources towards diversity and inclusion. Soon as we get in the bear market environment, whoop, all right, it doesn't stop, but the spotlight is no longer, the intensity is no longer there. And we, as we all know, when you get in a bear market environment, you have restructurings, you have reduction in force, everybody across the board is impacted. You look up the next time, the first day you're in a new bull market environment, now you have to completely recreate your pipeline because you've depleted your pipeline. And let me say one other thing about courage. Courage also means you have to have the courage sometimes to go outside and bring the talent inside. So often I've spoken to senior level managers and they want to grow them from the inside. We do not have that kind of time. Given what's going on in the broader environment, given how things are moving, the rate of change, you do not have 10 or 15 years to grow that talent. And there is no guarantee that that talent stays with you for 10 or 15 years. Yet, millennials have to see people who look like them in order to be attracted to come to your company. So you won't have the best and the brightest if they don't see diversity in the leadership. So it's important that you are intentional about that, that there's some level of accountability and that you are consistent. The second E stands for being engaged. If you're a powerful, impactful, influential leader, you must engage with your people. At the end of the day, if you allow me to generalize, most of us are motivated by one of three things. Some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by power and platform. Others by the public attaboy and girl. So if you are a powerful leader, you must engage with your people so you find out what's the parameter that will spur outsized productivity. And lastly, the R stands for risk. If you're a powerful, impactful, influential leader, you must be comfortable taking risk. But I ask myself why we don't take more risks, and the only thing I can come up with is that we're scared. We're just scared. It's fear. And hear me clearly, 2018 Catalyst Conference, fear has no place in your success equation. Fear has no place in your success equation. Anytime you approach anything in your life from a position of fear, you will underpenetrate that opportunity. And as I close, I tell you that success does not just happen. In order to be a powerful, impactful, influential leader, you must be intentional. You must be intentional about your communication. You don't ask, you don't get. You must be intentional about your performance. Always create a report card where you can under-promise and over-deliver. It works every time. And you must be intentional about your relationships. You cannot do it alone. If you want to be a powerful, impactful, influential leader, you must both expect and strategize to win. I thank you. And now the question session is yours.
Okay, questions? Oh, it must be Miller time, huh? Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, hi, Carla. It's uh, Catalina from AT&T. Loved, loved, lovely your, um, your talk. Just Thanks, so Catalina. inspiring. Um, and I also loved the fact that you talked about data being your friend. Um, engaging with your mentors, turning them into powerful advocates, that's, that's a key thing. So wondering what kind of data, right, um, did you find personally was the most influential in shaping yes. you? Yes. And taking you to the next level? Yes, and it was when people gave me the straight no chaser. Uh, data, right? And that's why I said you should create a safe place because I think so often many of us walk around with this look on our faces, right? And if somebody wants to give you feedback, they go, oh no, I'm not gonna touch that, right? Especially if they think it's gonna be difficult. So when someone said to me, oh, it's around analytical skills and it looks like this. When you said X, this is the perception that was created. Or oh, it was around presence, you know, which was an interesting one. I, I actually got you know, got that feedback one year. And this is why you gotta be also a little bit careful with, with feedback, right? Because someone once said that I had no presence. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm a big black woman walking in the room, you can't miss me by definition. <laughs> That's presence, right? But, but it was interesting, it was something that, and I had to, I'm the one that had to discern, you know, is there really something there or, uh, you know, or is that person just kind of throwing out something? So the thing that I tell people is if you get feedback like that, that you're not quite sure of that, go back to the person and say, I appreciate your, you know, giving me some feedback, but I'd love to, you know, get an example of where you think, you know, I don't have presence. Is it the way I show up in the room? Is it my uniform? Is it that I don't say anything in a meeting? I'd love to get something concrete. And if they can give you something, then you know what they were trying to say. And maybe they were trying to say that. And if they can't, then you know what power you can put that in, right? But it's important, <laughs> it's important that you follow up. Don't just say it's, it's crap, right? You need to figure out whether or not that person is trying to say something else. Because feedback is a gift. It takes courage for somebody to give you the feedback, and you need to honor that and, 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 and take it. But it was, it was when someone was concrete with me, I found that valuable. And sometimes, ladies, you have to give permission, right? Because many times, and guys keep me honest here, they just don't know how to tell you. And there's a, there's a fear factor associated with that. You know, fear that they're gonna say the wrong thing, fear that you're gonna cry, fear that you're gonna sue, I mean, fear is something, right? And so you gotta give people permission. And so often I found myself saying, hey, no, give it to me, I can take it. I really want it, I can't fix it if, it's not, if I don't know that it's broken. So I appreciate it. And whenever somebody gave me feedback, I did not debate. Don't debate, listen. Listen, because you're gonna learn something when you listen between the lines. Yes, Emily. Thank you. Again, always wonderful to see you. Just amazing, amazing every Thank time. You, so Carla, you talk a lot about authenticity. And I'm wondering, what, what is your advice when it comes to cultural, um, corp organizational culture? So you, I'll, I'll just stop there, because I see you. <laughs> Because I know there, there's some balance between being your authentic self. Uh, and I think Caroline this morning was amazing from Targets. It's like she could be in any culture and she would be loved. Yeah. But everyone doesn't have that maybe courage that Caroline has. So could you share how an individual might balance between organizational, Absolutely. cultural, and authenticity? Absolutely. So the first thing to understand is that we are all multifaceted. And so often I hear people say, oh no, I can't be my authentic self, they can't take the real me, right? <laughs> but, but, but you have to understand that we're all multifaceted. There's not just one you, right? So the trick to your authenticity is to be comfortable with who you are, bring all of that into the room. Then you can be free to meet people where they are. You do not have to have all layers of your authenticity on display at the same time, right? <laughs> and that's where I think people make the mistake, because they think, well, if I want to show that part of me, then they won't be able to handle that. If you're comfortable, then you just lay back and figure out where people are. So I'll give you the example that I like to tease, because I'm from the South. How many people from Alabama in the room? 
Okay, all right. So you, you'll get what I'm saying. So I sometimes do business in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, I know those boys cannot take full frontal Carla. <laughs> so they get Carla Light, right? Now, I know Carla Light would never survive in New York City, but Carla Light is just as much a part of Carla Harris as full frontal Carla. But I bring all of that in, and I figure out where people are so I can meet them right where they are. And that allows you to make a connection, because it's that authenticity that connects to the other person, right? And it is about being self-aware, and it is about understanding your environment so that you can have that comfort level when you go in there. But if you're not self-aware, you, you won't know which part to actually bring in once you get a sense of the room and you get a sense of the environment, right? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Carla. My name is Jamie Conrad. I'm from Williams, from Pittsburgh. And one of the things they talked a lot today in Emerging Leaders was, you know, be your own advocate and make your accomplishments known. My question to you is, how do you balance that line between being... Um, oh Too self-promotional? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, there's a fine line between um, confidence and cockiness. So. Where do you draw that? What advice would you have for that? Okay, so the line between confidence and cockiness really goes back to something I'm sure your mother said. It's not what you say, but how you say it. So it really is about your delivery there. But the way that, that I do it is that I'm very liberal with the we pronoun, right? Because none of us do anything by ourselves. We're all working in team-oriented environments. And you can say, look what we did, and we got this done, and we won this piece of business. By virtue of the fact that you're spinning the narrative, you're telling the story, you will get the appropriate amount of credit. And oh, by the way, if you're leading a team, they will really respect you because you're saying we and you recognize that you didn't do it by yourself. You might have led the team, you might have had the vision, you might have created the execution plan, but you needed somebody else's muscle to get it over the line. And your team will really want to work for you. And at, at the end of the day, you can't lead if other people won't follow, right? And so it's important that you use the we, and that way you get your accomplishments out as well. Then that'll make you more comfortable telling the story and putting your narrative out there. So that's the way that I got comfortable doing it when I couldn't say I, 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 I. And I didn't find that it was constructive I, I, I anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? You guys are easy. Yes. Hi, my name is Joy Lim from Procter & Gamble. Related to your point on authenticity, so um, I came from Asia, and as we enter into the U.S. corporate world, we see that companies are very progressive in uh, strategizing uh, DNI work, but oftentimes a lot of the meter stick is also still very much Western leadership standard. Oh. So I'd love to hear your point about um, you know when results are there, but leadership style sometimes gets into the way. Like over time, I felt like I morph into the best of Western and Eastern leadership style so that I thrive. But I'd like to hear your point about results and leadership style and how do you deal with that? You know, at the end of the day, I'm a big fan of the, the Shakespeare quote, to thine own self be true. And if you have found that, you know, an Eastern and a Western style has made you a very effective leader and those who are working with you want to work with you and you are posting up the numbers, I don't think there's any reason that you should adapt your leadership style to one or the other. It's working for you, it's working for the organization, the folks that work with you love that, then I think that's perfectly fine. That is who you are authentically. And, you know, as, they, as the old saying goes, it's your story, girl, stick to it. <laughs> right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, did you, have, right here, she was right here in the back. Did somebody else have one? Okay. Yes. Hi, Carla. Hi. This is Sandy from Texas Instruments. You're just such an inspiration. Thank you, ma'am. And before this, uh, we were chatting and we we're saying you're such a great person that sometimes you feel uh, you make us feel like we're inadequate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the great. Now Carla wait a minute, Sandy. I usually hear the opposite. <laughs> I usually hear people after I speak say, I feel like I can go out and conquer the world. And I'm like, that's right, girl, go get them. So what are you talking about? That's a first. 
So, okay, the great Carla, do you have moments where you feel like weak and uh, inadequate, and can you share that with us? You, oh, do I have moments where I feel in inadequate? Is that what you said, and what do I do? Oh, sure. I, you know, I've had moments not only where I've failed, I have had moments where I'm doing something for the first time and I may second guess myself. I've had times when I make a decision and I second guess myself. But usually, if I'm having some of those thoughts, I always want to be a person that walks my own talk. And my first book was called Expect to Win. So when I feel like I'm going down in that spiral of, oh, oh I go, expect to win, girl. Expect to win. Expect <laughs> to win. And I say it till it feels good to me, right? And that, that's what I do. And I just keep saying, and sure, it takes about eight times, and usually I'm like, OK, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. But you have to know that you know. And, and, I, and I know we're out of time, but let me just peel that onion. Because um, over the last year, as I've spoken to large groups, the question that keeps coming up is around this whole imposter syndrome. And I have been floored at how many times it's come up, because that was the conversation when I was coming out of Harvard Business School 30 years ago. So I am baffled as to why, how we are here now, and it's coming up. And that's what I hear in your question. And the thing that I say all the time is, yeah, every now and then you can have those moments like I just described. But you have to remind yourself, look at where you are. You are sitting in a room where somebody has paid for you to come here today because they believe you are a rainmaker. So if you don't feel like you are a rainmaker today, at least trust their judgment, OK? <laughs> and and you, you have to know. You have to know that you know that you know that you have everything you need in order to be successful. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten to this chair. I don't care what's going on in the micro level. The macro message is you are, in fact, all that. And you need to own that power. Everybody has a little dip every now and then, but do not stay down in the valley. There's too much room on the top of the mountain. I say thank you. <laughs>